Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting of the Dartmouth School Committee to order for Tuesday, August 18th, 2020. Could I have a roll call, please, Ms. Genther? Chris Oliver? Here. Shannon Jenkins? Here. Kathleen Amaral? Here. Mary Waite? Here. John Noons? John Noons? Is he muted? I'm here. Sorry, I'm here. I had muted myself. I apologize. We'll forgive you, Mr. News, this time. This time Thank only. Okay. <laughs> uh, per Governor Baker's order, suspending certain provisions of open meeting law, Chapter 38, Section 20, the public will not be allowed to physically access this school committee meeting. The meeting will be conducted remotely. Members of the public can access the meeting via live stream at youtube.com forward slash DHS TV media. In addition, the event will be a rebroadcast on DC TV channels 9 and 18 on the following days. Wednesday and Thursday at 5 p.m., Friday at 6 a.m., Saturday at 8 a.m., and Sunday at 2 p.m. The school committee reserves the right to implement additional remote participation procedures and will notify the public of these procedures as soon as practic practicable. Uh, this is the time in the meeting where we would typically take public comment relative to tonight's uh, meeting agenda. If you would like to comment, uh, please email Kathleen Genther at DartmouthSchools.org. And your email will be shared with committee members and available for review once tonight's meeting minutes are approved. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the numerous emails in respect, in respect to public comment that we have already received today. Uh, the committee members uh, received them. I believe uh, Ms. Genther acknowledges their receipt and uh, she will email you and she will send the committee uh, your public comments. That being said, I would like to take a minute here uh, before we continue with the agenda, uh, just to go over a couple of things. While I understand not everyone is happy with our decision, nor did I expect them to be, I will continue to respect your opinions and concerns relative to our reopening plan. I can appreciate parents and guardians being concerned for their children and wanting what's best for them. Just like you, I want what's best for my daughter who also attends the Dartmouth Public Schools. That being said, it is the school committee and administration's responsibility to see the big picture and what is in the best interest for our 4,000 plus students and staff here in Dartmouth. The logistics, the metrics, and recommendations from all stakeholders and were considered in last week's decision. That being said, ultimately, I feel after Dr. Gifford's presentation tonight, it is my hope that the Dartmouth community will find our plan is really not all that different from other area communities. As of last week's meeting, we voted to start remote with a transition to hybrid as soon as possible. Even with all the work Dartmouth and other communities in the area and across the state have done, these are only, remember, these are only proposed plans. They are fluid and they will ultimately be dictated by COVID-19 statistics. Uh, that being said, I will entertain a motion for the approval of the regular and executive session minutes. Uh, let's start with the regular session minutes of August 3rd and August 10th, 2020. So moved. A second. So I have a motion on the floor uh, by Mr. Nunes, a second by Ms. Amaral on the motion. Any further discussion? Chair okay, hearing none, roll call, Ms. Gunther. Chris Oliver? Yes. Shannon Jenkins? Yes. Kathleen Amaral? Yes. Mary Waite? Yes. John Nunes? Yes. Thank you very much, Ms. Gunther. Thank you, committee. At this time, I'll entertain a motion for the executive. Uh, let's. I'm sorry, I really should have taken the regular session minutes for August 3rd and August 10th together, um, but we'll, um, we'll approve the regular session minutes of August 10th at this time, and then we'll take one motion for the executive session minutes for both dates. I thought we did approve both the 3rd and the 10th, Mr. Chair. Did I say that? I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't... No problem. We're good. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Nunes. So no I'll... Problem. I'll entertain a motion for the executive session at this time. So move, uh, Mr. Chairman, with the stipulation that they be held until the matter for which they were intended is complete. I second that. 
I have a motion by Mr. Nunes, a second by Mrs. Amaral on the motion. Any further discussion? Uh, roll call, please, Ms. Gunther. Chris Oliver? Yes. Shannon Jenkins? Yes. Kathleen Amaral? Yes. Mary Waite? Yes. John Nunes? Yes. Uh, thank you again, everyone. At this time, um, under old business, uh, discussion pertaining to the back to school plan, I am gonna turn it over uh, to Dr. Gifford um, so uh, she can share with us uh, updated information that she has relative uh, to the reopening. Okay, thank you. I will be sharing my screen, I hope. Let's see. Okay, oh, let me get back to, okay, that's fine. Okay, so as you mentioned, Mr. Oliver, um, we did vote last week for um, to begin remote with, with the promise of having a plan or tentative dates um, and what our plan would be to move into hybrid. So that's what we'll be discussing tonight. Um, and as always, like last week, I wanted to provide some clarifications for some, some of the questions we've received. I've, all of us have tried to answer folks, um, but also know that some things will be answered tonight and hopefully people will have some clarification. So I just wanted to clarify that once again, the June survey that we sent, or it might've been early July, um, was really just a temperature check. And unlike what some folks are thinking, it was a vote. Obviously a, a situation like this, we. We can't vote what we think is the best um, plan of action. We can only use that as at least a sense of what people are thinking. So with that, um, you know, we did in the beginning, obviously we wanted to uh, get right into hybrid. That was our intention right from the beginning. But as data started to uh, pile up and, and some issues came up, we did what we did and made the vote to start in remote. Um, the survey that folks just received recently, and, um, that one is meant to give us more information as we are developing cohorts in our transportation plan for when we go back to hybrid. I understand that some folks wanted more information. I answered people that asked us that certainly they can still submit and change submit their information once they've heard tonight's presentation and even as we get closer to uh, hopefully the chance that we get back to school. It was, as I said, just meant to gather as much data as we could because some folks are pretty set already on what their plan is. Some do need more information and that's fine. So we tried to get a quick turnaround because we are planning our cohorts and like I said, the transportation planning is um, quite involved. Um, so I just also wanted to say that, well, I kind of just said a lot of that, um, but we, we also, folks mentioned the governor's metric tool that he released. I just want folks to remember that was released after our vote. So unfortunately we didn't have that information and the Friday before the governor's press briefing was about how the upticks had happened. He had implemented a, a task force, if you will, to find people, et cetera, and that they decrease the number of people to be in, in a group together inside. So listening to that on the Friday was part of the data we used of thinking, geez, what's going on? And then of course we took our vote and Tuesday we had the metric. So going forward, of course, that will be part of our, um, some of our tools that we'll use. I also want people to be reminded that this is everything that we talk about here and that the committee votes on is, an, is a proposal we still have an obligation to bargain all of the existing conditions of employment. We are continuing those bargaining sessions. We actually have one coming up this Thursday. Um, and as a reminder, please send questions, questions related to any of this to questions at dartmouthschools.org. If you um, comment such as the comments for uh, tonight's meeting, we continue to send those to Ms. Genthner. That's We're trying to keep that separate because we are planning to have an FAQ virtual meeting, if you will, after this to see what other questions are still out there. 
to, to continue to provide folks with information. So I just wanna go over a few things and there's a few updates when we consider moving into hybrid. Uh, as I told you last time, we have some enhanced cleaning protocols. We are working to add hours and um, during the day to maintain, you know, really get those high, high touch er areas and continue to maintain those and keep them clean. Uh, we have got, purchased some air purifiers and also Mr. Kylie um, has purchased those electrostatic sprayers, which will be used nightly in the areas in the classrooms. Um, and of course the, the spray, the chemical has, is all approved. And we did discuss this with the uh, local uh, director of public health as well. Uh, we do continue to have sufficient and proper PPE and we do still feel that a, a slow roll into this really provides teachers and students with a chance to get used to this new model and to do it right. Um, we're looking at now the change in weather and the reduced heat. I know when we did the building tours two weeks ago, uh, that was a concern in some of those areas. I have to say we, uh, Mr. Kiley and the director of public health and the town nurse did another building tour. Um, I guess it was yes. Yesterday. Yes, yesterday, Monday. And um, I was happy to feel that much more comfortable in the buildings. Of course, we had that cool weather come in. So that's part of our thinking when we look to, um, as you'll see, the plan to move back into hybrid. Um, still looking at the guidance about the, the airflow, the windows, the fans. With Chris Misha, we did check those windows and um, thought of ways that we could continue to uh, enhance that airflow out of the windows that we do have. Uh, we do con still considering staffing. We know that's going to be, that can be an issue. And um, we're looking at the idea of when we have teachers out, whatever the reason it might be, are we able to use them virtually um, or remotely? And also uh, much, you know, our TAs do tend to cover classes for us. Um, and we would hope that that would be a possibility um, as, as things move along. I talked about the uh, nurses stations. We did show the Board of Health that as well. Um, we updated, we have more information which we'll do tonight on the virtual platform that we'll hopefully be using and continue to monitor the guidance which I did um, um, reread today and the guidance for about those what if scenarios, if a person is positive, if a person has symptoms, et cetera. We'll be looking at that very closely. There is a lot of good information in there and a lot of guidance. Um, so again, I just mentioned the survey. So please get that in when you feel comfortable with the answers that you're receiving for the families. And of course, we have the latest information from the governor and um, that metrics, which we'll be using and watching what is happening with the other districts. Uh, this is just from last week. We know we have all of these, um, the PPE, as I said. Um, Nothing new here, same safety requirements of lunches in the hall, uh, classrooms, et cetera. We did, I didn't know if I mentioned last week that we have, um, we have storage bins on site now that we're emptying classrooms to make them uh, use, you know, just keep the furniture that we absolutely need. Unfortunately, the district, because of the work that we've done over the years on collaborative model, the collaborative model and project-based learning, we have so many big tables that students have been using. So it's been um, quite a chore to empty the classrooms out, fill the storage bins and prepare them for students and staff. I do wanna mention that teachers are going to be able to keep those essential teaching items that they use in bookshelves. Uh, we just don't wanna take up a lot of space on the floor for lots of things, but we have built in bookshelves. And so those manipulatives, those books, leveled readers, et cetera, will be uh, able to maintain in the classroom. People had some questions about that. Um, once again, the only updates on the financial support is that the ESSER um, grant was approved and we bought um, technology and um, PPE equipment with that grant. So uh, update on the virtual learning, just a quick one and then I'll go a little bit more detail on the middle and high school. As you remember, we, we kept waiting for DESE to come up with a, a learning platform. And um, we've now made, the, uh, they're very expensive. I have to say very expensive. And so we've, we're have we working to secure the best, the best model that we can, the best platform um, with um, 
to try to be cost effective as well. So we looked at all of these. Um, I'm gonna go, actually, I'm looking to the next slide in a second. That has more detail for us. But I do wanna skip down to professional development plan. As you remember, the teachers will be having 10 days of professional development. And we're working on that now as creating a framework. And I just reemphasize the um, spraying with the electrostatic sprayers with EPA approved disinfectant. And as I said already, we're continuing to collaborate with local health agents and the town nurse. So let's get into the virtual platform. Uh, some people, you know, the state called it a learning management system. What we have decided for our high school and middle school students is that we are uh, contracting with a group called Edgenuity. We're very familiar with this because we have used it at the high school over the last few years for credit recovery and a couple of other individual situations. We will be obtaining a site license. So actually all of our students at the high school and middle school could in um, theory have access to this uh, comprehensive library catalog of courses. As you can see, it offers everything um, that we will need for students that might choose to not attend Dartmouth schools to come into the school. We will, we're not sure who, what, who, will, when, or why, or whatever, but Dartmouth staff, we will either through a stipend, uh, we do have lead teachers that have done, facilitated or supervised these students as they embark on this educational process. So we will make sure that a Dartmouth staff member will have a cohort of students, if you will, depending on how many uh, choose to enroll in the virtual platform. And as always, we will have um, information on our website about that. And certainly we'll be able to answer questions as people uh, decide to um, choose that, that system. For our elementary system, uh, school system, our elementary students, excuse me, we are still, we thought we had one that we were um, pretty set on going with, which was the TECA. Um, but we have, uh, been in contact with a couple of other schools that have are using the Edmonton as well. So we just found this one out. So we're looking at that one. Why I wanted to use something different from the elementary is the, the bundle of courses um, are taught by a Massachusetts licensed teacher on the other end in cyberspace, if you will. So students, unlike the Ingenuity, which is a platform of a catalog of courses and students are more independently learning with, as I said, a, a Dartmouth staff member supporting, this, this system would offer a, a teacher who would teach live sessions and um, also present recorded sessions as well. And, but just like the middle and high school, we would still have a staff member from Dartmouth supporting these students, making sure that they stay on track. So basically we're not saying to the parent, here's your platform, good luck. We'll see you in uh, the spring or something. We wanna maintain um, connections with these folks. So we'll continue. This one is not quite set. And as you can see, Again, it's it, the range of cost, it's quite expensive. I just wanted to update the committee a little bit on courses requiring, as it says, additional safety considerations. And as you can see, that's really about those, um, the theater, the chorus, the band, the phys ed, those kinds of things. Uh, right now we have, we do have the small groups of students with masks, socially distanced, outside practicing. I was at the high school today and just want to let folks know that that is much different than an in-class situation with the, what we've um, having to abide by the guidance. It's much easier obviously to separate those students for these kinds of activities as we have been with the strength and conditioning. So there are some, there is guidance on that. We are going to have to look at the course. Um, it, as it says, you know, they have to, um, those are just classes we have to wear masks, et cetera. So we'll be looking a little bit more at that, but I wanted folks to see that there is some guidance that has come out um, and also the guidance about sharing of equipment. So that is permitted. We, they encourage that kids obviously hand wash before 
using that, of course, sanitizing their hands. We just said wearing masks and socially distancing. And we always have enough supplies around to disinfect. And I wanted to reiterate that at least for our uh, elementary schools, we are purchasing, uh, actually the orders have been coming in uh, for the curriculum kits with various tools and essentials that the students will need in the classroom. So they'll have their own box of tools. And many of you may have heard that for sports, MIAA, they have a task force that's been meeting with um, DESE and from the governor's press briefing today, we are supposed to expect DESE's guidance later this week. So we still don't know what's going on with that. So transitioning to from remote to hybrid, and again, this is um, proposal. As we all know, anything can happen depending on the COVID, um, what's happening with the virus, what's happening with staffing. There are many, many, many things that we will be looking at. We're continuing to look at the DESE guidance as we have here. I am always watching the governor's press briefing. We now have the matrix to look at. And of course we uh, consult with our local uh, public health office as well. So as a reminder, um, remote learning right now is set for September 15th to September 30th. This is now my proposal for tonight. Um, we have created a robust regular daily schedule for students. We already said this attendance is required and there will be grading. What I want to mention to parents, because I had a lot of questions on this, is that while the students are receiving a daily schedule and it's pretty rigorous, the teachers will still have the flexibility to run their classrooms like they always do. They might direct teach. They might then say to us, to this class, your assignment for the next half an hour, like we do in, in brick and mortar, read this book or whatever it is, or, or work on your, your independent work. Let's come back in, in at 930. We'll, we'll discuss what we just did. There is project base. It might be all of those things. So I don't want people to think that a child is going to sit and stare at a computer for six hours. There will be breaks. There will be assignments that I want them to think that the classroom is running like the teachers do it. But yes, there is the connection with the technology, of course. People might remember we also have on our enrichment site, and I'm sure the teachers will be posting things on their Google Classrooms. Um, they had like PDF uh, documents that the kids could fill right in if there's an assignment to be turned in, things like that. So I just want to make, hopefully help people feel a little bit more comfortable that we're setting up a schedule to provide a block of time that creates structure so that they know at 930 is my English class or whatever it might be. I log in, I get my instruction and in teaching from my teacher. I might go off and now do my assignment and come back. We have breakout sessions that can happen in the, the classrooms as well. I don't know how to do it, but <laughs> that teachers do. And then just to be also be very clear um, on the goal, the plan, and with DESE guidance and legal requirements is that the pre-K students whose IEP requires them to be in an integrated pre-K program, our plan is that they attend all five days, half a day. It would be a nine to 12 day with a grab and go lunch. Of course, they'd be recessed, et cetera. But that's our, ex that's our plan right now, the pre-K IEP, that plan that requires them to be in our program. The peer partners will not attend during this, this time. So no peer partners. We are still planning, and I know parents received a letter. It was in my letter, and I believe um, Dr. Dale, our new director of early childhood, sent out as well that um, 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 sc screening, what I was going to say stressing, I don't know where that came from, <laughs> Freudian, <laughs> screening will take place. We're looking at, I think it was October 20, uh, excuse me, August 24th to the 27th. So we're looking at securing, um, we, need, we needed one more staff member for that, but peer partners, those accepted and those who are on the waiting list will be um, contacted and they are able to be screened looking forward to the future that they will get to school at some point. 
It's the same with our paths, PALS and PASS program. Those are students um, with significant needs, our higher needs students, and we will be inviting them. At this point, um, we were looking at five full days. That may be adjusted as, as things change, but at this point, we would be inviting those students to attend school during the remote um, time. So our, our uh, proposal to start again, not knowing what's going to happen and we will keep our eyeballs on everything that we've talked about and make that decision as we get closer is um, in October, and I've, I've laid this out, I'm hoping it's clear. Obviously more details will be posted so people have a clear understanding. We're also looking to create our calendar with color codes so that cohorts, parents will have a good visual of when their cohort of students is in. So we're looking to, to transition on October 1 and 2. It is a Thursday and a Friday, but we were thinking that it'd be a good time, like an orientation day for these pre-K through 2. So that would be the peer partners that I just talked about. Pre-K through 2, our early learners, readers who we want to get into school and not have to learn to read on, on computers. In grade 6, why we chose grade 6 after discussion was, again, another a big transition year elementary into the middle school. This would give teachers time to acclimate the students to the hallways, to the bathrooms, to the cleaning, to the mask wearing, um, those kinds of things. Uh, so, so as I say, so on October 1, the Thursday, the children who have been put into cohort A for pre-K through two and six would be coming on Thursday and then cohort B pre-K two through six on Friday. They would then begin their first full week of school the following week. And this is how we, we, um, we are recommending that this run, that the students go three days a week and then two days a week. We checked about the deep cleaning situation that people keep mentioning. It is not, an, it is not I think, and I'll, I, I hate to say this like this, but cracked up to be what it, it's, People have really not defined it in, in really, they just say it. So with our discussion with the local um, health agent, as well as following the guidance, we've read it and reread it with our enhanced cleaning plan, as well as the nightly spraying of areas, um, we feel we would have as good as a cleaning plan as anything else. We also thought this was the best, best model because we are keeping kids engaged on a regular schedule. From our perspective, sending a child to school on Monday, Tuesday, as some people suggest, and they do not return again to the following Monday, Tuesday, seems to be a, a bit of a disengagement from learning. So we're trying to maintain that learning let's flow. On, let's put it on top of the uh, dehumidifier. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Noons. <laughs> and just as an example, their second full week, just so folks can see how it works. So week one, the cohort A is Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Next week, they're Tuesday, Thursday. On their remote days, I'll mention this. Well, I mentioned that later. Let's finish this up. Okay, so then we're thinking our next plan of action is the week, that second full week that the first group is in, we're now bringing in the second group. 13th through the 16th, we have group two. Those are the rest of our elementary students, three through five and transitioning grade seven. So the middle school now has um, another grade level to orient with the passing through the halls, the cleaning, the how, how the classrooms will run, et cetera. Same thing, because it's the 13th through the 16th, if you look above where it says second full week, Cohort A, once again, both times is in Tuesday, Thursday mode. That week is a little different because Columbus Day. So we're, we're pretending it doesn't exist, hopefully, and then we're beyond it. We stay in our flow, but Tuesday, Thursday, and a Wednesday, Friday. So each cohort attends school for two days that week. Our final transition, 19th through the 23rd, is group three. And same thing, it's group it's um, grade eight, so we complete the high school, uh, middle school, and the high school. 
I do want to reiterate, we are still working on cohorting the high school because of some of the class sizes. We're having difficulty with that, but we're brainstorming again tomorrow and um, we'll come up with something, how to make sure that uh, all of our classes meet the guidance and our students can fit comfortably in the classes. But once again, cohort A would come Monday, Wednesday, Friday, cohort B, Tuesday, Thursday. We are working very hard on our cohorts and we cannot take requests for this or that or the other. It's too difficult. We are trying, we are considering siblings. We're putting siblings together. Uh, we're doing it across, because this is across the district. It's not just this school for cohorts and that school for cohorts so that it, the district team has been working with all of the principals to create these cohorts. Um, because that then lends itself for the transportation as well. Students will be assigned seats, as we know. So once the cohorts are established, Mr. Kylie can then work with the transportation and create the bus routes that pick up these students, um, fitting about 20 students on a bus. During the remote days, teachers would have assigned their students. So if you attend school on a Monday, your teacher would have assigned you some whatever work it is, a reading assignment, whatever it might be, you're expected to complete that work on that remote day, preparing for the next day when you return to school. And I just wanted to mention that students who choose to enroll in a virtual platform, like we just talked about the edgenuity, we will have them remain in that platform until a semester break. So we would alert them when that semester break was coming up so that it can have a smooth transition should they choose to come back to join the hybrid model. So our next steps, of course, similar to last week, we are continuing to prepare our buildings uh, for that transition. They're still working on cleaning uh, classrooms out. Um, some teachers were in, I saw some yesterday, working on removing some things and getting their classrooms set. We are continuing our negotiations with the DEA uh, as I said before, we have a new metric, which is the one from the governor, as well as the continued DESE guidance in any updated governor information. And I say that because they are informative and that does kind of give us the sense of where the state is. We will continue to monitor neighboring school districts. I hope they're very successful and that can give us some encouragement on their first few weeks of school. And we're also, um, Mrs. Oliveira was looking to uh, work with some of our teachers to create some videos that might help uh, parents kind of understand, get a better glimpse into what it might look like. I'm not sure if these might go up on our, on our enrichment page because we're continuing that as well. Um, we are scheduling our FAQ virtual meeting. I think it might be the week after next, uh, just before school, uh, the teachers come back. So that's why I'm asking folks, if you have further questions to send them into questions at dartmouthschools.org. So we'll be able to address some of those. And once again, please complete the survey if you haven't done so, there's plenty of time. So with that, I'll just reiterate, this is a proposal and um, certainly we'll hear the, the committee's thoughts. And um, I was thinking that we might wanna take a vote of approval if that's the committee's um, wish. Stopping. Thank you, Dr. Gifford. Welcome. I know that you have, uh, you know, constantly reflecting and talking to colleagues and peers and trying to make, you know, come to terms with what's the best decision and, and how to how to make this uh, a successful transition to hybrid. Uh, that being said, before I turn it over to my colleagues, just really quickly, one of the things before I forget is uh, in regards to the videos that you're putting together. I think what might be helpful, um, just so you know, some parents or parents that are interested might be able to see what classrooms will look like, what schools may uh, may look like. So I'm not sure if we can do some pictures or maybe a quick little video of the, the different schools, especially at the elementary level, the kindergarten. I'm sure if, if I'm a kindergarten parent, I'm extremely nervous. I'm worried about my, um, you know, what what it's going to look like for my child. Right, and to that point, that's a good point. And I'm also, I must, I didn't say the um, elementary schools are creating some videos explicitly for kindergarten. Uh, so that's, that will be nice again, like a little, or, and I know um, a number of the others know that's just like the school base, the middle school we do in like a virtual um, kind of orientation, but 
to your point, also that idea of what might a remote learning classroom look like kind of thing. Right. I think that's really important. I'll turn it over to my colleagues at this time for questions, comments, concerns. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. White. Hi, yes. Um, so first of all, thank you. I think that clarifies quite a bit, Dr. Gifford. Um, certainly I know that you know, having those benchmarks in place was a big ask from so many of our families. So, so thank you. I'm, I'm hoping we'll be in a you know better place now, just to kind of you know move forward and uh, be positive and engaged. Um, I had a couple questions um, as we look at this you know new phased in model. What, the way I read it, well, the pre when we talk about the pre K, the preschoolers just are they they're not doing any remote that's that's one question that i have like are they just the way it looked to me that it would be kindergartners but pre-k are just going to go into hybrid without a remote model for them is that correct yes that is correct okay is, we just didn't think it was it was going to work with our pre-k students trying to get you know parents have to have i know i understand parents have to have involvement with the younger guys anyway but right it was right, asking right. i think a little bit much <laughs> <laughs> okay and then um, again, I agree with you know the pictures. I, I had a couple of requests from parents who really wanted to find out about what the you know, and this gets back to Chris, uh, Mr. Oliver's point um, that they want to see again with the pre-K. There were a lot of concerns: are are they those children who are coming in going to have to wear masks, a six-foot distancing? You know, what does that look like in terms of breaks? You know, so if we you know if we can provide those parents with clarification, I think that would you know be pretty meaningful. Yeah, it might be good uh, along that lines, once again, to provide pictures even of the classroom. But yes, uh, we are we are expecting really the same uh, things. The, the, the little desks have been spaced out. Um, the mass, of course, uh, students that have medically, are medically exempted from mass and or behaviorally exempted. Um, that's what we, we have, they, they can, but our expectation is that everyone wears them. We are expecting mask breaks, stretch breaks, all of that, hopefully getting outside, being able to um, run around without those masks, et cetera. But okay. yeah, yeah, unfortunately that's kind of what it is these days. Okay. And then, you know, just looking at models too, I had, um, and I'm, you know, sorry to dominate here, but I know some parents had, you know, were concerned in the elementary if they have multiple children across different grades that there are different lunches. I understand that that's necessary though for specialists. Could you speak to that? Just, you know, to explain that um, to parents. Exactly. It, it does have to do with, with the specialists um, being able to then go into classrooms because as you might remember, we share staff. Um, we, you know, some of those specialists travel from school to school that's one of the reasons also that we want to keep um, the schedules the same, whether we're remote or hybrid as well. It, okay. It's just a matter of trying to get fit it all in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And those, and those, um, so let's say art classes, phys ed classes will continue within the remote model, you know, and those students will have the materials that they need as part of a kit or, or is there a suggestion there for materials that parents w might want to have, or will those materials be, what would you suggest on that? Yeah, yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Um, we did send home to the elementary at least a suggestion for. We know parents like to hit the sales early, right? Uh, right. I don't know how early it is right now, but um, recommending things that they do purchase rather than your basic binders or whatever it might be to have at home. But I I don't recall that we mentioned anything about like an artwork, etc. I know some teachers become very hat were very creative last time and had kids using rocks or yeah. rocks, paper sticks, but anyway, but I'll um, check with the, um, the letter, go back to the elementary and middle, of course, whatever the, the whole group, but I'm not sure if we really talked about that piece okay. that, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm sure I have more, but I'll pass it on to my colleagues. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you, Mrs. White. Uh, Dr. Jenkins. Thanks, Mr. Oliver, um, and thank you, Dr. Gifford, and everyone on your team for doing this. I want to start off by sort of um, following up on Mr. Oliver's opening statement um, and really just reiterate that there are a lot of concerns at play here. Um, I know a lot of parents are thinking about this from the perspective of their kids and their lives, and I know it's very hard for families. We 100% understand that, but 
there are just so many issues that are unresolved now. And there was a number of good articles in Commonwealth Magazine over the last few yeah. days on these issues. Um, so for instance, I know my university um, has a very extensive um, testing and contact tracing um, protocol in place that's gonna probably cost us, um, even with our de-densified campus, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. Um, people have been asking, well, why don't you test? We don't have the money to test. Um, and the state and our national government has simply failed to provide um, a robust testing and contact tracing system. Um, and if you look at other countries who have successfully opened schools, that is fundamental to the successful reopening of schools. Um, testing and tracing, we don't have it. Um, we're dealing with, with buildings that don't have adequate airflow. Um, you know, we have to worry about, um, we have to keep our teachers and staff healthy, right? Do we have the space to do that? Um, there's all sorts of concerns that we have to take into consideration, um, you know, that, that, that aren't just health metrics. Um, and we're starting to see, I think, a lot of um, school committees speak up about this because it is, there are a lot of moving parts here. And I think the other thing I want to reiterate on top of that is, um, you know, the, the, if I remember this correctly, right? Desi has given us 10 professional development days. Um, those must happen at the beginning of the year, right? They cannot be spread out over the rest of the year. Um, speaking from experience as someone who has taught face-to-face -face and online, these are very different styles of teaching. Um, and it's not something that's just, oh, you just translate it, you just do it, right? You have to learn how to teach remotely. And so I think we partially wanna be prepared for the remote teaching and use those professional days to train our teachers to do that so that we're doing it right and we're doing it well. Um, if we never have to go back to remote after the first two weeks, that's great. And I would be happy to have that happen. But if there is a resurgence and we do have to go back to remote, we don't get those 10 days back, right? Those 10 days are gone. Um, and trying to move back online with a day or two of professional development is going to be a recipe for disaster. So I'm happy we're gonna use this time to figure out how to do our remote learning right. Um, we can learn from the experiences of other districts to make sure that we are doing this right and our kids aren't yo-yoing back and forth from in-person to remote to in-person to remote. We wanna do this right. Um, and so I'm, I am very happy to, to see that we're trying to do that. Um, a couple of things I, I've been thinking of is in terms of sort of managing this for, for families. Um, and so one of my first, I just wanna confirm that sort of, even though teachers have freedom to do their class how they want, we're, we're gonna be using the same LMS, right? We're gonna be using Google Classroom so that families and whatever, in particular the middle school or high school where you have multiple teachers, it's all gonna be in one place because I know as a parent that becomes difficult to manage if things are all over the place. So are we going to have some requirement that, that the, the one LMS is used across the district? Yes, we're using Google. Yes, Google Classroom, okay. Google Meet. Okay. Yes. Another big concern is, is that I know we always have parents by supplies and you know it's, it's in some ways can be unfortunate. Um, because that can be difficult for some families. I am very deeply concerned um, that our expectations for supplies are going to be greater this year because we're going to be remote and doing some learning at home. And I'm very concerned um, about how um, particularly our families who are in free or reduced lunch, but even other families may be able to afford some of these things. Um, are we going to be able to implement any sort of programs whereby if you qualify for free and reduced lunch or you need support, buying some of these extra materials that we can use some of our CARES money or some additional money um, to help support parents and, and set up a learning environment um, where all kids can, can, can succeed. We, other than what we've done with the elementary, purchasing all the supplies um, for the classroom, we haven't really talked about that, to be honest, and but we can certainly consider it. I, it'd be good to hear from the teachers what they think you know, will be needed, of course. And that's what we did with the elementary level. I know the principals um, got their information from the teachers and certainly we can consider that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I just yeah. I hope that we can be really sensitive to this. Yeah. This I mean, last year in the spring, I won't name names, um, but one of my children had to do an experiment that involved using food 
um, which I thought was not particularly great, right? If you laid off from your job, you can't get to the grocery store. Um, and the, the experiment involved the wasting of food. And I was like, ah, but, you know, um, so I think we just need to be really sensitive about um, the economic conditions and the economic demands on our family um, and to make sure we're doing everything we can to not put extra burdens on, on family during, during this time. Sure, they've got enough, we know, <laughs> yeah. That's all I have for now. I'll go. If Ms. Sure, Mrs. Amaral. Okay. Um, although I don't have, everything's kind of all over the place. No crying this week, I promise myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. All right. So thank you for addressing. I, I got a lot of uh, questions, as everyone did, I'm sure, about the um, the length of time with the, you know, on the screen with remote. And so I'm really glad that you, um, I sort of alluded to that and I sort of thought that that would be the case, but I'm glad that you, you sort of gave some, framed that in a way that people can sort of understand that it's not necessarily right in front of the screen all the time. Um, let's see. <sighs> Sorry. Um, I also heard from families around, um, and I know that there's HIPAA, you know, concerns, and, and there certainly needs to be some some rules around this. But for families who maybe have more than one child, it was posed, and I thought it was a good question, so I'm going to ask it. Um, say, for instance, they are attending, you know, they're able to stay home and they're attending to their children in two different. What if they missed a lesson in a different grade? Would there be an option? I mean, I know Desi talked about parent training and stuff like that, but would there be an option for somehow a, 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 a documented via maybe a video or just documented information to the families around what was capturing what was covered that day so that those families who might need to come back to it at the end of the day to review uh, could have the opportunity to do that. I don't know what that would look like because I, I can imagine you can't really record the Zoom with all the kids on the, I wouldn't really want that to happen. Obviously we couldn't with with the uh, privacy, but that was brought up. So that's just something potentially to think about. Um, the other um, issue, uh, parents around the pre-K and uh, you know, I've sort of been an advocate for us enhancing our criteria around the 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 um, knowing we're going to face to hybrid sooner than later, but just that while we're in the remote, those kiddos were identified high needs as Desi defined them, and I sort of alluded that I would I wanted us to sort of enhance that if we could. I understand that not all that can happen, but a family brought to my attention, and it was another great point. <laughs> um, was that we have the pre-K for our, our, our students who are in IEPs who have in another IEP the socialization with um, the, the full day program. Uh, but we're pulling then, once we go back to hybrid, correct, we're pulling in the peer partners. I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this. Uh, a, I just wonder if there's a way that we could frame it so that we're not just looking at the peer partners, the perfectly behaved ones who might not necessarily, um, everyone needs in-person learning, but I don't mean to say it that way, but there might be students who, who wouldn't be targeted as peer partners because they're also kind of on the, on the line, borderline struggling. Um, might it be helpful to pick in, pull in some of those kids instead of those kids who might not necessarily need it as much. I don't know um, if I'm articulating that correctly, but, but it was a good point in that if we're matching up some peer partners in a hybrid, those might not be the one, you know, that wouldn't be the next on my list to get in after the high needs personally. Um, let me see. And then you probably heard this, I've heard it from several parents and I don't think you touched upon it, although I was paying attention, but it's just, none of this is family friendly, parent friendly. Um, in, in, in identifying the, the cohorts, um, 
some families have their own little pods of, of socialization now with their neighbors who might be in the same grade and the question was posed. And I don't know if this came to the full committee or if it just came through me uh, from a few people. They were wondering, is there a way to identify on a survey that, you know, I live next to Johnny and, and Johnny's in the second grade and we really want to split our um, the, uh, the teaching at home, the care or that kind of thing, swapping the days with the parents so that they could work a regular schedule or whatever. Um, might that be something or would the, that be too complex? Something they would have to stick to, but something that we could help people maximize their ability to make it as easy as possible, I guess. Um, so that was brought to my attention. I won't take much longer. Um, I think you covered this, so stuck with the choice we make. So I think you talked about if somebody chose uh, the online platform uh, that after the semester, so you answered that. Um, that's the pre-K one. Sorry. Okay, uh, and then I just had a question. So we're um, phasing into hybrid, but while we're remote, my understanding is that our, our collaborative is in session or they were through the summer and I don't know their schedule for their, how that works if they're working in, 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 in unison with the districts that they are um, a, a part of. But if we didn't go back, you know, in person, the classroom say we have in the high school, would they have access to our building um, during the time that we are still remote, but they are in person? Um, yes, we've actually. Okay. Yes. Oh, awesome. Good. Okay. And I just made a note that it was really crappy that Baker put that out the day after we voted. Um, in, in regards to PPE, it's not like a sticking point, but it is sort of a sticking point that I, I just I just know how much PPE my family needs to use. Um, we have PPE, we have enough PPE. Do we have more than a month and a half worth of PPE now? I would love to have us have a few months of PPE. Mr. Kiley, I think you said three months at least, if I recall. Okay. okay, that makes me feel better. Uh, I love the idea that was brought up with describing the classroom for all of our learners, but specifically for the, the ants in their pants, littlest learners, kids who can't sit still, um, the reality of what that's going to look like. That is not going to be something easy for I them know. to live with. Um, so getting pictures out, describing that would be very helpful. Um, oh, goodness. I had some questions from families um, and not necessarily in district, but with out of district placement. I know Desi, uh, and I happen to be one of those families, but not for this particular issue, but some family, I know Desi identified that the district that knows them best. So the out of district is responsible for the learning and all of that. Um, but say some of our really medically fragile students who, who have uh, nursing hours, and this might be better addressed with Beth during the CPAC meeting. So if you don't have an answer, that's fine. But I worry, I guess some families are um, without nursing, with, without that chunk of whatever it is, 35 hours a week during the week now. And I know too, for my son with PCA care, Mass Health, it's a whole other ball of wax, but um, it's worrisome if that, I don't know if that can be something that can be looked into as far as why that's happening or if there's a way to help that fam help families get those kinds of needs at home. Um, but again, that's, would you agree? Would you, Probably something for a special yeah, ed. Yeah, I, okay. Yeah, I'm gonna let because I don't want to say anything that's not legal. Yeah. <laughs> yep. No. No. Yeah. Absolutely. Um. And then there are so then there are those families that I can identify with that are just really struggling and just so afraid to commit to anything because they maybe they're receiving some. Um, center-based in-person currently ABA services. And we all know how that works. And you, you're on a wait list for eight months and you finally get services and things are working. And then you go back to school and then you lose that spot. And then we go back to remote because there's a surge and those kids are left 
back on a wait list for six, eight, 10, 12 months. So that's just something um, worrisome that some families were wondering if uh, something could be looked at individually around if they chose in person or they only chose two days. If there's a, these are the, the, these families are the high needs families that I'm thinking of that I've spoken to. Um, but it's a, it's, it's a reality. And I think, oh gosh. Oh, you mentioned that you're going to be going over this some more, but in terms of the quarantine for, I was reviewing Desi's yeah. uh, regulations. So yeah. they were saying, you know, th that students who are in these self-contained cohorts, so our high needs population, that they would, because they would be closer potentially because <laughs> than six feet in those yeah. classrooms, yeah. Um, they would have to quarantine for 14 days unless they elected to have a test. test. And so then in lies, would they go to a remote platform or would there be some system around getting some of their, like the, the setting up for tutoring, that kind of thing? Would it just yeah. go back to the remote or? I think um, obviously these different scenarios have to be studied, really studied because we want to okay. go by it. But um, we've asked ourselves that question as well, because there are so many of those individual things that do happen. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we, in my mind, I'm thinking that they would still receive something, whether, as you said, through a remote service or, but one of the problems we'll have and we'll have to address is the staffing. Just as a, just as a, for instance, if teachers are teaching the full schedule and then let's say two students have to go out who does that because our staff's teaching the schedule. It's, it's complicated. Yeah. It's, complicated. it's just a mess. huh? <laughs> yeah. um, thank you for everything that everyone's. I have one more question that you may have answered and I apologize if you covered okay. this, um, so much. <laughs> but we, we, talk, we talk about the pre-K um, returning the one, the, those kiddos that are returning in person potentially right away and then skipping over, I'm thinking of kindergarten through two mm -hmm. kindergarten self-contained um, high needs program students on IEPs. Those students who only spend a portion of their time in a sub-separate and, and might rely on those hours of inclusion, um, would it just go so, I don't even know what I'm asking. I, I think guess- I you're asking. I, would there be like a cohort for yeah. them to kind of yes. go in during did, this time. Yes, we did talk about that. And okay. they, we've talked about the idea. Um, we, we had this conversation, whether we have um, a TA that goes to the room that the teacher is teaching remotely and is there present or not, or just sits in their room. And so someone takes them aside for that inclusion piece. So yes, we have discussed okay. that. Don't have the definite answer, but it's part of yeah. our discussions. And um, I think I tried to cram that all in. I think yeah, you did a good um, job. <laughs> that that was I'm probably missing a bunch, but at any rate, thank you. I'm sure other people have questions, so I turn it over to you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> thank you, Mrs. Amaral. Uh, lots of good, uh, lots of good questions there. Absolutely. So no worries, uh, Mr. Noons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and again, thank you to uh, Central Office and all the building administrators and everybody involved in, you know, all the work that they're uh, they're doing on this. And in all seriousness, too, uh, thank you to uh, Chris Michaud and the Board of Health and you know his staff for all their work and making sure we've got T's crossed and I's dotted and you know being another set of eyes to see what we're doing and that uh, going through the buildings you know yesterday and i thought they had some great questions and great points to uh to learn from so you know my thanks to them a uh, couple of quick questions i don't have as many as everybody else i hope uh easy one first uh students and this is mainly in in the high school and maybe in the middle school you know some middle school too but in the high school if you know a parent is going to keep Johnny or Susie home for the whole semester doing remote. Uh, are they going to be able to be in extracurriculars, you know, band, sports, uh, the clubs, that type of deal? 
That's a great question. And um, we haven't made that decision, but I know of some districts that have said, no, that's not my belief. Um, I haven't, I, I think if they've chosen remote for good reasons, like it could be medical reasons or anything, we still want, we, in my mind, I don't want to then like punish them and say, you cannot no. be involved with your peers. And I know other people look at it differently and say, well, if they can't come to school, they can't go to strength and conditioning or something, but we haven't made that decision, but um, that's my personal belief that they should be able to participate. Agreed. Okay. Uh, question in, in general, you know, for all the grades uh, with the remote learning, what are we using? I mean, are, are there going to be any books for these students or materials to pick up at school before school starts to use? Or I'm just thinking sometimes you go to do something, you know, with a, a homework assignment or something and say, you know, boy, if I had the book, I could go back and reread, you know, that chapter in math right. or chemistry or whatever the case in point may be. Yeah, most, like I said, most things we've been already purchasing, but, um, and obviously the devices, there'll be an, a dissemination time for the devices for anybody that needs it. But um, we, the, the buildings will make sure that happens, whatever is needed, yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Robbie says, this, this may be for Mr. Kiley. Uh, and I know I kind of mentioned it the, uh, uh, last week, the, um, the lunch situation for, uh, mainly with, I mean, at this point in time, as we start the remote and, you know, for the high school, you know, uh, grade eight and high school students, as they go out almost that one month from school, what are we doing for, you know, those that qualify for free and reduced lunch? Have we crossed that bridge yet, or that's, we still waiting for, uh, USDA and everybody to, figure something out well we, i can say mr noons that we are prepared to cross the bridge and um we need some approval from usda some guidance from the state to continue a program that would be some grab and go program during the remote yeah. period and then during the hybrid period um uh, providing meals to kids on the days when they're going to be remote so our intent is to be able to do all that. Um, and I don't see any reason why we can't. But um, at this point, that's you know, still a work in progress, I think, from a, from a regulatory persp perspective of the overall program. But I would anticipate that with so many districts doing models like we're doing, that um, all that approval will come in time. Yeah. Um, and that we'll be preparing grab and goes and, and take with you on the day you're, you know, leaving school and not going to be there tomorrow, um, yeah. you know, take, take food with you. So we, we intend to do that. Okay. And last is just a, a kind of comment. I'm going to make an assumption. That, I mean, of course, this plan has got to be very fluid. And as we go forward in seeing what other districts are doing and, you know, you know, communicating with them, you know, what's worked, what hasn't worked and, you know, any mistakes that they've made. So, you know, maybe we can not make those mistakes and, you know, hopefully we have a smooth entry back in the school in October. So thank you for everything. Thank you, Mr. Nunes. I guess as I have some questions now, I guess it's, uh, I'll take a, take up a few minutes of time. So, Let's start off. I have, I have actually, I have several of them. Let's start off with the uh, the remote learning piece in virtual schools, Dr. Gifford. Uh, one of the questions that I had was, uh, you listed, I believe, twelve hundred to twenty eight hundred dollars per semester um, for, uh, I think it was Tecker or the other one that you just recently started looking at. Um, that's for the, that's specifically for the elementary schools, correct? Because Ingenuity is for the middle and high school. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So cr it's been a while, but correct me if I'm wrong, the elementaries have trimesters. So is that is that price multiplied by three? Because you said per semester. 
that's a good question. And okay. this, yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, but I believe no. I believe it's okay. it would be for the year. I think they just call it that. Yeah. Okay. Now, with that being said, I know that a lot of the virtual schools, such as Tecca Greenfield Academy, um, that operate out of the with Massachusetts licensed teachers, that once students are enrolled in those districts, uh, two things happen. I guess one, uh, we transfer them uh, with state reporting uh, with Department of Education, so that we're no longer claiming them as students. Typically, if if a parent elects to attend a uh, have their child attend the virtual school, and then the virtual school will enroll their student and start reporting, claiming them as theirs. Uh, you know, one thing that I'm curious on, I, I, I haven't been able to get a straight answer with any of my colleagues right. as to whether or not um, that's the case with this and we'll lose funding, Chapter 70 funding right. um, and state funding for, for these students. Yeah, that's definitely. And, and I know we've had our tech people on phones and trying to get answers about these things. That's why I said we're still investigating, but we discussed that today as well. Okay. And if that's the case, we have to go in another direction. Um, but there's no answers as of right now no, as to... No, no, Even to get a return phone call right now. And I imagine they're very busy. I, <laughs> but, I, I've heard that they're very difficult to get a hold of. Yeah, but that, you know, and again, the ingenuity piece, if we were to use that with elementary, that's just extremely, I, I think almost beyond what we could pay, even okay. with funding. Um, that's why we're trying to investigate these other programs, as well as the fact, I did like the idea that um, at least Tekka um, and I think the others as well do do some live teaching rather than just recorded lessons. So we, right. we have more to do on that for sure. Okay. Thank yeah. you for that. Um, but I just wanted to folks to know that we had made progress and at least we know for the middle and high school, we have a virtual platform that will be ready to go. No, at that's... Least- that, that's great to hear. And I'm sure uh, parents that choose to go yeah. fully remote with their students will be happy to hear that. Uh, can we talk a little bit about um, and as far as the protocols around um, what happens once we go hybrid and once students start to come into the classrooms? Because as much as we received a lot of emails and concerns from parents that we weren't starting uh, in-person classes right away, uh, we also got a lot of thank yous um, that we were uh, starting remote, um, and a lot of people felt that was the right idea. Um, so, and they were concerned about whether or not they would even, you know, send their students in a hybrid. And maybe this will help parents try to understand a little bit what's the protocols going to be if a student becomes, you know, s- symptomatic and quarantining, and not just them, but their their class their their classroom their teacher um, because the last thing we want to do is start hybrid or start in person learning and then you know someone's symptomatic and they've been ex- they've now been ex- exposed a whole classroom full of students or even fifty percent of that classroom because we're only we're doing two cohorts um, and now we've uh, these students have to quarantine can we just talk a little bit about that and what parents can expect. Do we have a, do you have anything on that right now or maybe um, in a future uh, meeting? Yeah, it, it, the guidance that came out from DESE and is really um, very thorough and very specific to those different cases um, in general. So it'd be kind of hard to talk through all of that right now. Sure. Um, maybe on a QA and a with the, yeah. with the schools or with parents. Yeah. But in general, um, if, if someone is symptomatic, et cetera, obviously the parent would come get them and we would then, and I, I think I gave um, the committee a wrong answer today um, because I reinvestigated, but um, they, would be, they would be asked to get a test or they have to quarantine if they have those symptoms. So those are gonna be um, some of the things that parents will be told and staff. Um, then of course it goes to if there was a positive, there's this stuff happens and how close were they and for how long of, long of a time with the cohort? Uh, it was like, if you weren't in contact with this person 10 to 15 minutes and six, it, 
So it goes on and on to so much sure. detail. But I think one of the things that parents will need to know is that if someone is tested positive, that goes automatically to our Board of Health. They receive that information. Um, folks are then, of course, encouraged and, and they want them to tell us, the parent to tell the school, so that we can then have the appropriate procedure in place for contact tracing with, of course, the Board of Health. Um, it, it talks a lot about the agencies helping each other to figure out who's been in contact and then what the proper protocols. But I think the bigger picture, and we've all been, we all know this, that when these things start happening, how many teachers do we lose to a quarantine or, or a cohort? And those are big decisions. And it just feeds into the whole um, array of significant issues that we have, but um, we'll follow the guidance. And, and the other thing it says is that you would then let parents of those cohorts know we had a positive test or whether it's a staff member, et cetera. So okay. we do have just, just for, we do have the guidance linked into um, our plan on the website that parents yep. want to read through that. It is, it is in there. So we have a section in the plan that just talks in general, a paragraph, and then there's a link right to this guidance. And once again, where can parents find that link? Um, on, it's it's in, in our plan, which came out, the link for the plan, it's a website. It came out on my Friday's update yep. last Friday. Um, I'll ask our tech department to put the link to the plan right on the website to make it easier that parents might not have seen. And That'd then be great. within the plan, because there's a lot of drop down and links in, there's one section, if they download our plan, um, there's, we link away, there's all kind of bunch more links and one of them they will see about COVID scenarios, how to respond, and they'll be able to read this entire guidance. Perfect. That yeah. sounds good. Thank you very much for that. On, on another um, on another note here around, um, I was wondering if maybe Mr. Kylie, uh, Dr. Do you Can have I something, Shannon? That specific issue of COVID and contact tracing. Sure. People have been asking why are the high schools going back the last, and that's partially why there are only group that's not really potted. That's the right. Schools are in pods. The elementary schools are in pods. They have one teacher or they have two teachers. That's not true at the high school. That's right. right. Cross potting, right? All of the kids are mixing, and that's why, because it is the most. There's lots of logistical issues around special education too, but from the, the high school, it's that cross potting. Yes. Like if the kid is positive, they're going to infect five, six classrooms, teachers, and then those teachers are with other. That gets really, really complicated, and so I think it's important to point that out. Yeah. Yep. No, that's that's really true. Was that a new term you just came up with, cross potting, or is that? A... <laughs> Might be. I don't know. I'm sure someone else has said it somewhere. Sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to point I'm that out. College of education. <laughs> Thank you, um, Mr. Kylie. In in terms of transportation, you know, one of the things that is logistics and the logistics around making uh, transportation work for our students and families in Dartmouth. And I, I, could you just take a minute to explain to the committee and to everyone watching what goes into, well, first of all, I got a couple of questions as to what's the plan for uh, sanitizing buses? Are, are we going to be looking to sanitize after every trip, every day? Are we going to have bus monitors? I know we, uh, the state has tossed around using, the districts could use funding grants for, for bus monitors, especially for the younger, the elementary students. Um, and then what goes into, you know, me, the hours and time um, and de uh, attention to detail and the just the feedback, your, your, these surveys that were coming out about transportation, that it's no easy task, just transport, never mind once the kids are in school, just how do we get the kids to student school? Well, I'm, thank you, Mr. Oliver. I'm, I'm glad that you recognize that it's not easy. It's, it's certainly gonna be a challenge for everybody involved and, and <clears throat> What the state's guidance um, presented was an opportunity to place approximately 25 students on a bus. Um, but there are some factors that we've considered as we've uh, gone through this planning process that will um, limit our capacity slightly um, to be slightly less than that. But what uh, the state has indicated is that it is acceptable for students to be um, 
sort of opposite sides of each seat on each row. So a student who is in an, on an aisle seat in one uh, row, there is a student across from them on a window seat in another row. And it is a zigzag pattern all the way up, uh, all the way up the bus. What we've done in Dartmouth is created a, a space at the front of each bus for a student who um, might become symptomatic. So we're sensitive. So there's there was assigned seats um, on every bus, but if a student were to become symptomatic or be boarding the bus and parents are not available to take the student home, um, we would then be placing that student in the space where there is um, no other student within six feet. So uh, masks will be required on the bus. There'll be hand sanitizer on the bus. Um, I've explained the distancing pattern on the bus. It's challenging in our hybrid, uh, hybrid format. Once we begin that, we're gonna be covering the entire town twice, essentially. So we're gonna have two sets of routes, um, one for cohort A and one for cohort B. Uh, double the number of routes that we've had previously. Wow. So, so um, our intent is that we are going to try and impact the school day um, as little as possible while still accommodating um, time to clean in between the, the high school, middle school route in the morning and the elementary school route and then in the afternoon the high school, middle school route, and the elementary school route, be cleaning uh, between each of those cycles. So it's, it, it is going to be a very difficult um, process, even though on a given bus, we'll be transporting, in some cases, um, you know, significantly less than half the kids we would have had on the bus previously. Um, we still are going to have our hands full. And as you know, um, you know, being the third largest community in the Commonwealth is um, is very challenging from a transportation perspective. It's a long way from the tip of the town to get to our schools. So we're going to. That, that's I'm sorry. That's actually a really good point. That landmass wise, you know, that, that we are we we are considerably a large community landmass wise. Yes, it's it's always been a challenge. And, um, you know, we've always made every effort to keep um, kids on the bus as little as possible, as short a time as possible, but nonetheless have come close to an hour uh, under regular circumstances for some students. Now we'll have less stops on each, um, each run because we'll have less students, but um, there'll still be there'll still be issues that we have to balance. We in transportation don't have the cohort yet. So um, we can't create the routes yet. So as soon as we get the cohort, we'll begin strategizing the routes. And really it's gonna be pretty much like creating them from scratch. Uh, it's gonna oh. be very different from previous years where we could use a base route and then look at, oh, we need to add this street or that street and, um, you know, accommodate that. Well, this is going to be totally different logistically. It's, and we, um, we purchased a new transportation software in the spring, which okay. I am, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not regretting it, but it's, um, it's an interesting time to do all this. So we're working on that. Um, of course, uh, so a student who um, does get on the bus, if the bus driver is able to identify that they are um, ill or presenting symptoms. It's a lot to ask for a bus driver to do, um, but they will be given instruction as to, you know, the symptoms to look for. If they're able to identify that while a parent is still present, uh, we'll uh, ask the uh, parent to take the student, um, take the student home and go from there, um, advise the school and the school can call the parent and let them know that they should have the student tested and so forth and go through the process. If um, 
if the student's on the bus, then that student will be the first one off the bus at the school and uh, the school will be radioed and know ahead and the nurse will, um, you know, will treat the student and set really in this case, um, if it's COVID related symptom, you know, follow the protocols uh, that, that, that they have, that send them home and sure and testing. Um, let's see. That that is the basic idea of, of transportation in our in our um, information gathering uh, effort and asking parents. We have asked that parents provide one morning and one afternoon uh, transportation location. It is we have uh, traditionally provided <coughs> a, a a great, much greater level of service than that, but it isn't possible given what we're trying to accomplish to um, provide, you know, multiple locations. Um, we're trying to limit the exposure to kid, of kids and we really need to know where to go in the morning and where to go in the afternoon. Um, so we're appreciative of the families as, as we work with them on that. But um, yeah, it's, sure. it's, I've got a lot of work to do. You do have a lot of work to do. Is it safe to, so it's safe to say, Mr. Kiley, that parents that, like you said, that may have been accustomed in years past to having, you know, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays in one location at the grandparents' house, and then the other days maybe at home or maybe to a daycare, that this year they can expect that it'll be one location Monday through Friday or through their cohort days. That's correct. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Kylie. I appreciate all your, your work and the, the diligence on uh, trying to this monumental t task of uh, transportation. Thank you all for your support. Um, on another note, um, one of the things that I've, I've heard come up is about, um, you know, we're requiring, we're going to be taking attendance um, in our classes, whether it's um, in person, of course, in person, but even remote. And correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Gifford, but that is, that's not something that just Dartmouth is doing. This is the Department of Education requirement in which they will be uh, collecting. This is data that the state will be collecting through their typical collection processes of they want to, they want to have an idea of the students that are attending, whether they're in person or they're in remote. So this isn't just something that Dartmouth's doing, correct? That's correct. That came from the commissioner. That, uh, that's that was my he thoughts wants, too. You know, he wants to make his emphasis was on making it more robust, of course, and just as as enriching as we can. So, yeah. Okay. And one one last question around technology. I know that Mr. Galishaw has done a, a great deal of work around, um, you know, device getting, making sure we have enough devices for for any student that needs something. And I know that the. Um, our internet rate um, for households in the town is extremely high, um, but we do have some families that, that have concerns about um, internet connectivity or um, high-speed broadband. Um, that being said, uh, is the district working, uh, is the district willing to work with families that may need access uh, to, you know, the digit digital curriculum and digital resources because they do not have any internet, whether that's through, I know Comcast Internet Essentials, um, whether stu if students uh, um, qualify for free and reduced lunch, families can get, that's, can get internet for $9.99 a month. Um, and I know a lot of districts are looking at um, mobile hotspots, uh, jet packs, through cellular companies to offer um, using CARES Act funding um, or some other kind of grant funding um, to help uh, those families that are in need of uh, internet access? Yes, um, we're working on Wi-Fi hotspots and com with Comcast. And also um, we are waiting to hear about the uh, tech grant that we put in for, so we don't have that answer yet, but uh, we are looking at different possibilities in order to help folks yes so we're not just going to shut them off but we'll do what we can but more to come That's, on that okay great thank you dr gifford uh, mrs wait yes i guess the penalty of going first is that i have some more questions sorry guys um so i have a question um dr gifford about ingenuity for the high school um platform and i know and i think all of us have gotten some questions from parents who said well can't we just start the year on that platform we know my my child 
you know, is not in a position to go back to school. And they're concerned that if they're starting AP Chem program, for example, in the classroom, you know, on remote with their teachers from Dartmouth, and then they go on to the Ingenuity platform, that those, what, what they've learned may not sync up and they've lost some time. And, you know, couldn't they just start the years, you know, with their Ingenuity platform? So that, that was a question that I've seen come across um, from several parents, you know, just just worried about, you know, switching teachers midstream and, and content, you know, I don't know what you think about that. I'm trying to think why not. <laughs> I think I think it's a good question. Um, something we hadn't talked about, but let me think about that. And yeah, let me think about that. that, that okay. A very good question. Well, thanks. Um, the other question, a couple other questions. Um, I know we had talked about substitutes and when we talked about having a uh, daily subs that would come in, we don't want to do substitutes that are, you know, moving from district to district for, you know, obvious reasons. We want to keep those substitutes in house. Um, we do are, you know, there is talk in, a, in a, you know, about TAs that are going to cover some of that. You know, if we have someone sick, I mean, who knows? Um, I'm sure this is a very competitive with other districts right now, but if we thought, looked into hiring a few full-time substitutes that will go into the various, you know, one for the, you know, a couple for the middle school, younger college age kids are just out that are dedicated to our district. Have not explored it, but it's come up in our conversation. I do know of another district that's done that. And um, okay. one of the things they also did was increase the sub pay. Uh, I shared that with Mr. Yeah. Kylie pretty, pretty dramatically. I, yeah. I believe that was Fairhaven that doubled their sub pay. Yeah. I, saw I saw that. that. Correct. Yeah, yeah Fairhaven so, did that. Um, I do believe their plan is to do exactly what you're saying. Um, so it, yeah, cause it's a big concern. So we have right. to, um, and, and, we will be having another uh, one of our next big discussions is about staffing and, and the human resource, the personnel piece in general. There, there'll be more. But um, and it's another good idea for sure. OK. And then I also have had um, just as we all have um, some parents who are reaching out again, getting back to the younger you know, students who, you know, they have kindergartners, first graders. You know, I know that often, you know, children are, don't necessarily aren't tested until sometimes second grade for things that are, that are starting to show up. Maybe it's dyslexia, you know, or, or some other, um, you know, um, something else that would put them onto an IEP, but they feel confident that their child need, you know, needs that special attention. And, and then, you know, in that same framework, we also have had parents who reached up and said in the spring, I, you know, I really didn't hear from, and we know the spring was a mess, like they're, you know, it's all over the place and, you know, in all fairness, but they felt like they did not hear from their child's special education teacher. So I, I guess what I would hope is that, you know, seeing these children coming back, they're going into a new platform, you know, whether they are an IEP or they, you know, aren't, you know, they're your younger children, but I'm hoping that the teachers, if they are on IEP, that the teachers, or, or 504, that the teachers meet out and come up with a plan specific to remote learning for those children. I think that that's something that our parents are really hoping for and it's essential. And then, you know, also I'm hoping that, you know, our teachers are great, you know, and I really feel confident they're going to want to know their children. They're going to ask questions, but I think, you know, communication is something that, you know, we got to work on, I think is, you know, just throughout this whole process. And I think parents, you know, sending that information to teachers, you know, saying like, you know, you know, I have little Johnny and Johnny is having a hard time with the screen. He's really shy. You know, he, he feels awkward if he's in class, you know, you would come up and ask him a question and I know he would participate, but you know, on a screen is very difficult, but having parents and those and teachers having that dialogue so that they know that I think is, you know, something yeah. that those are some. Yeah, and one of the things um, the special education teacher during those 10 days, and I know it, it's just all difficult and even their right. schedules of trying to get the minutes in to service the students, but part of their task will be to develop um, a learning plan for those students. And um, as, as we did in the spring, but um, with this schedule that we've developed, hopefully to be able to have more contact and be yeah. with, the, with the students as you're mentioning. Mm. And then I guess my, my last question for now is, um, you know, we're, we're kind of embarking on this as a, you know, a safe and smart, slow return, which I think is fantastic. I guess the question I have is, you know, we're progressing and we know we're looking at benchmarks as a group. Are we meeting at regular, inter like where, when are we meeting to discuss, okay, 
we are ready to move on to the next. I mean, we have those dates, you know, if everything's in the same trajectory, but, you know, if we have a, co a, a student at the high school, let's say, who yeah. does test positive, like what is, I, I, what is our threshold to say, like, we cannot move forward or, you know, it, you know, it, it isn't going as well as we hope when we brought in the, the seventh graders, there's some, you know, so we should slow down or we should step back. That's just something I think we, as, as a board, it just needs to be ironed out and it's yeah, hard. I, I, I agree. I mean, as we've been saying, this is so fluid and anything can happen that um, we just need to have ongoing conversations uh, throughout this entire process. And I want to give parents enough notice if we do shift right. gears um, to, you know, that they're prepared for whatever it might be. So. And, and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Chair. Thank you. Oh, Thank you, Mrs. Way. Uh, Dr. Jenkins? So yeah, uh, those Commonwealth Magazine uh, articles suggested that many school committees are moving to a two-week schedule um, in the fall to stay up to, to date on all these and to review metrics. Um, and even though it's going to mean a lot more meetings for us, I, I definitely think we should. Um, the other thing that I will say to follow up on Ms. Wade's comment, um, we have personal experience making the transition from start miss schools into online learning. If we can make it work, those students should start out in ingenuity. Um, even though even though the curriculum's aligned, they don't they don't perfectly align. Um, I, I think I agree. Like I said, I, I'm fine. I was trying to find a loophole of something that would say you can't do, but I, I have to say I think I agree with that. And yeah. we hadn't really thought of that, but um, I think it makes much more sense. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Well, I want to thank everyone uh, on the committee um, for your, your thoughtful comments and uh, concerns. And I want to thank Dr. Gifford, uh, Mr. Kiley, and all the other administrators and uh, staff, faculty and staff in the school system that have uh, worked countless hours. And um, a lot of them, a lot of the staff just volunteering to be on different committees. So I want to thank, take this opportunity to thank everyone. Uh, that being said, um, yes, uh, Mr. Nunes. You're unmuted, it looks like. He might, might have froze. Yeah. While he's trying to get in, I just will mention we started Project Time today. So our new teachers did come in live, uh, the high school library with their masks and, and Ms. Oliveira and staff oh. did a nice job. So it was good to see them. And how many new staff are there this year? Oh gosh. Um, about? Yeah, about 12-ish. Okay. 12 Kate, Kate's looking at me. Yeah. Great. Thank one, you. Yeah, so we'll have an update on that soon. Perfect. Uh, Mrs. Amaral and Mr. Nunes, uh, you're with, can you hear? Yeah. Oh, good. You. Okay. So uh, I'll go, I'll go, let's go to you, Mr. Nunes, and we'll come back to you, Mrs. Amaral. Uh, in all seriousness, do we need a, we need a vote to approve this phasing hybrid? Yes. I'd like a vote. Okay. So I'll make the, I'll make the motion we approve the phasing into the hybrid model uh, as presented by the uh, administration. Do I have a second? And then we'll discuss. Second. So I have a motion by Mr. Nunes, a second by Dr. Jenkins. On the motion, there is discussion. Uh, Mrs. Amaral. Um, when you brought up the attendance piece, I just it just brought to mind. So some of my work circles, you know, we're, uh, with that attendance, Desi wants to take the demographics to see who is where and what. Um, I, I, in, in my work circles, we're just concerned about those students, um, you know, who, who there's some difficulty around getting on for whatever reason and, and having the attendance like typical when we, what is it, more than 10 days absent? Yeah, chronically absent, that. yes. Yeah, and so um, in thinking about at this point in time, especially with, you know, the hybrid that we're presenting is alternating weeks and parents are really gonna have to scramble with childcare and potentially having a family member, hopefully they do, or someone watching their children. I just worry about those students who aren't able to maybe log on because, you know, grandpa got distracted <laughs> or there's internet issues and in that, we, I hope we will take it individually um, and look into these cases rather than assuming 
negligence on the part of someone not um, logging in and attend for attendance purposes. That's just a concern of mine. I, I think that's a fair point, uh, Kathleen. And, and I, I would really hope that for students that chronically do not attend remotely, that there is some type of follow-up and communication from the student's teacher um, to, the, to the family to find out you know, what is going on. Yeah, that we, definitely that will be, that support will be there. I agree, I agree. Thank you, everyone. So any further discussion? Okay, so uh, chair hearing none, roll call please, Ms. Genther. Chris Oliver? Yes. Shannon Jenkins? Yes. Kathleen Amaral? Yes. Mary Waite? Yes. John Noons? Yes. Thank Once you. again, thank you, everyone. Uh, I appreciate all of that. Before I uh, give it over to Dr. Gifford for the superintendent's update, I am going to have to excuse myself uh, for a family matter. Do, is there, do you know update, uh, Dr. Uh, Gifford? That, I think that was enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Perfect. So once again, thank you. Um, for, as far as report of the chair, I know we currently have a, a meeting scheduled. Is it for the 24th? Is that what I saw? Um, yes. My thoughts, uh, just throwing it out there to the committee. I know, uh, you, you know, Dr. Gifford and uh, the entire administration is going to be busy next week preparing for the return of teachers on the 31st. Our, um, do we want to meet next week or is it okay to meet on uh, the week of the 31st? Uh, what's the committee's pleasure? 31st for me. Okay. Is everyone else okay? Hang on. It's fine. 31st is clear for me. Do we want to meet on the, uh, it, I just want to be sensitive to the first day of school for faculty and staff on the 31st. Um, do we want to meet on the Tuesday instead, the first? Uh, Mrs. Waite? Uh, that's fine. I guess my only point that I didn't is, uh, Dr. Gifford, you had mentioned the Q&As. Can you get that? I just am worried that your parents will be asking questions in the next two weeks and that we won't be coming in next. I just, there's been so many questions that I'd hate for those to, you know, not get addressed. So I, I would say if, as soon as you can get those forms out with those, you know, dates and topics, I, mm -hmm. yeah, just so we know that those can be addressed would be great. Sure. And then otherwise sure. I am fine. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm free. Okay, perfect. Uh, Shannon? Yeah, no, that's all right. Go ahead, Kathleen. Kathleen? Um, and just thinking like with the start of school and the teachers coming back, would we then be moving our meeting um, back a couple hours or are we going to still? Well, that's, that's what I was. Yes, good. That's actually an excellent point. Uh, so is everyone okay with the, what, Tuesday, the Tuesday, the first? That works for me. I'm good okay. with that. So if everyone's okay with that, let's plan on that. And then I would, I would personally... At that point, uh, I would like to see us um, back in person. Um, so I'm not sure what that will look like, um, but I'm sure uh, at the media center we can. Uh, it's big enough that at the high school that we can um, we can socially distance ourselves uh, from one another. Yeah, if we're if we're doing in person. Are we going to push the time back? I, I think. I'm not sure, I can make a four o'clock in person. I'm, I'm perfect. I was going to say, let's, let's, I think once really that's, that's what the week school was supposed to start. Um, it is starting for the faculty. Uh, right. So let's go back to our normal, our normal schedule of that's 630. Fine. That's fine. Uh, so 630 on the first, correct? 630 on the first Dartmouth High School Media Center. And what are what are our thoughts for public comment or for the public uh, being attendant? I know there's all kinds of, I, I don't think we can do it um, because of the parameters in place around um, yeah. uh, large gatherings. Um, so I would say it'll be streamed. Uh, the, the whole public comment piece will be the same. The only difference is that the Dartmouth School Committee will be meeting in person. Yeah. I do we have some legalities here? If Dr. Gifford can check we'll, with. Uh, yeah, we'll check on that, Mr. Noons. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Uh, thank you. One other thing before I go and we end up. Uh, 
And we end the meeting is just very quickly. Um, I know that uh, the, the committee received a number of emails regarding our, our focus in previous weeks around our, the Indian mascot. Uh, that being said, it, I said it right from the start that our, our number one focus is the reopening of school. And once school is reopened and is stable, uh, we will look to form uh, that committee. Um, but just just be please be cognizant that, that that's not going away. Um, you know, in the fall, we'll look to that and that'll be under the committee's purview um, to, you know, decide what we're going to do at that time. Um, as well as I support um, Dr. Jenkins. Um, there was some some feedback we received around Dr. Jenkins and um, her attending in, uh, a forum by the NAACP. She attended on her own. I don't I don't have a problem with that. I don't think any of my committee members um, had a problem with that. Uh, so um, that being said, you know we're, we're all individuals. We all make our we all speak for ourselves. Uh, collectively, we make up the Dartmouth School Committee. Uh, as I was once, uh, as someone once told me, the power uh, of a um, of a political body doesn't lie with the individual. It lies it, it lies with the full voting body. Um, so um, that that's really all I have to say about it. Um, so thank you, um, and we'll leave it at that. Uh, that being said, anyone else? Uh, any any comments, questions for the good of the committee or the community? So, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Yeah, just re just real quick, and I know you've got to go in that, but uh, seriously, just a, a, a thank you to, uh, to Kate, our wonderful secretary, with all the emails that she and everything she's been getting and she's been for for forwarding to us and to Dr. Gifford and replying to them and everything else. I mean, you know, it's, yeah, it's her job, but boy, to, the number that she's gotten is well, uh, way over, uh, way overboard type of deal. So just uh, my thanks to, to Kate for everything that she's done. And I it's appreciate it. Thank you, Kate. This is an unprecedented time. That's all I have to say. And the amount of hours that anyone in education is putting in right now. Uh, Kathleen? Yeah, no, th I, I just want to reiterate what John said. The, the amount of, of emails that we're receiving and quite honestly, um, it just seems like a lot of them aren't coming from real, like a, a, they seem like they're coming from an app, you know, like a disguised person. And so the fact that we don't quite know who all of these people are and you taking the effort to forward them to us and us reading them, despite the fact that they may or may not be coming from as large a mass as they, they would like to uh, allude to, um, that thank you for that, that work because, um, yeah, unprecedented time. So that's all. Phone calls too. She takes all right. phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, oh, I'm sure the phone's off the hook. Uh, Mrs. Way, and then I got to go. Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Oliver. I just wanted to, uh, again, reiterate, um, thank you, Ms. Genther, for, for everything that you've done and, you know, sharing all these emails. Um, I also want to say, you know, I'm really hoping that now with this meeting, I think Dr. Gifford and her team did an excellent job answering, I think so many of the questions and I hope our dialogue did as well that our town is having. And it's my expectation that moving forward that we have a much more positive community response. We all are on the same boat. We wanna get our kids back in school. You know, We want our kids to be safe. We wanna have a safe community and we want our teachers to be safe. So it is my expectation that the level of dialogue in our community um, is kind, polite, productive. Um, and I think many of us, you know, we have those expectations and, and we want to move forward from, from what it has been the last week. So with all due respect. So thank you, Chair. Thank you to all my school committee members, Ms. Genther, um, the administrative team, Mr. Kiley, appreciate it. Thank you. At this time, I will entertain a motion to adjourn into executive session for the pur purposes of uh, update on collective bargaining with union personnel, uh, not to reconvene into open session. So uh, moved. Yep. Got okay. a motion by Mr. Uh, got a motion by Dr. Jenkins, second by Mr. Nunes on the motion. Any further discussion? Roll call, please, Ms. Gunther. Ms. Oliver. Yes. Ken Jenkins. Yes. Kathleen Amaro. Yes. Mary Waite? Yes. John Noons? Yes.
Uh, this meeting is adjourned. Have a wonderful night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy, Chris. Thank you. Take care. Yeah.